first of all, welcome. Thank you for coming, etc. Um, this isn't a formal CPD. There will be no certificates. It is more just about us having a bit of a chat and a hangout and trying to explore some ideas. Um, the thought behind it was a bit of a Twitter debate that we had online about sort of defensive principles and we thought we'd just open it up and actually try to delve into it a bit more. Obviously, Twitter can be quite a hotbed for discussion and difference of opinions. But what we want to try to do tonight is welcome challenge and welcome some discussion around it and hopefully, you know, challenge you guys to think about some things differently. Um, we just ask that you are being respectful and challenging in a positive way. So everyone should be able to voice their own views um, and there shouldn't be anything that stops that, really. Do you want to add anything, Will, or should we crack yeah. on? And I think, you know, just encouraging those differences of opinion, um, because that makes for a, a richer debate, really. So plan is, Will's going to stick you into some breakout rooms. Um, hopefully you've got your pieces of paper ready. I've just realised I haven't done one yet, but um, we're just going to have a quick chat. So some of these questions were sent out just to give you some ideas and thoughts about shaping or developing your defence defense principles. Um, and we just want in smaller groups for you guys to make some connections learn some faces and have a bit of a discussion. So we'll dive straight in. So we're just gonna crack on. Um, idea is that we um, we discuss a little bit of context first of all, and then I'm gonna fly through what my thoughts are on my defense principles. Um, and then Will's gonna have a bit of a chat about his, and then we're gonna get onto some more sort of group work and tasks for each other. If you could hide your video now, this will just help with hopefully any lagging or anything like that just because we're going to be pretty much on slides for the next 10 minutes or so. I have challenged Will to be concise because there's no way he'll be as quick as I will. Well, <laughs> why say in one word what you can say in seven? I missed that. Anyway, um, so first thought really is different parts of the pitch ask different questions. So as I say, in our group alluded to this um, and we were talking briefly about what we thought um, different parts of the pitch are so obviously if you're in the circle it's going to be much more high pressure um much more contained space and it asks very different questions carrying through midfield um and then the key thing probably to highlight from this is different skill sets um allow for different types of defending so some people um will be far more confident to do certain skills than others will uh, likewise physically mentally the way that you are defending as a player Will depend on what your strengths are so I personally like to channel players playing as a forward I like to channel players with my reverse stick onto my forehand because that was where I was comfortable um, despite being told by my coach to use my forehand all the time uh, I think I think within there that's, that's where you've got to build this picture of context isn't it so um, and I think the, the showing on the backhand to go on the forehand is all part of deception and defending it's similar to showing one thing of to actually what you're playing, um, which I'm sure we'll touch on as we go. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's almost like a film <laughs> uh, Within this, I think the, the, the key thing for me, oh, you're controlling the screen, aren't you? Oh. Yeah. Um, the key thing for me is that um, not all space is equal. Um, also, not all space is equal for each person as well. So, again, we're looking at different skill sets and the idea of your team strategy. So, I've got three different pitches here. Uh, this is um, England 16s versus Belgium, I think. Here we've got Malaysia versus India and then Belgium versus Germany. And we're, we're seeing in, in each of them how space might be valued or space might be taken advantage of in different ways. Uh, so the, the point really of this is just thinking in, in your mind, how are you prioritizing space? How are you allowing your individuals to prioritize space? And what are the factors that, that lead to that judgment? Probably a um, rule of thumb, though, I think that we, we sort of agreed and we had quite long debates as normal um, about this and some of the stuff we've agreed on. So some of my principles are similar to Will's, some of his are similar to mine. Both, both agree, though, that you can't stop everything. Um, and this is certainly about trying to create a framework for how your team can react using their defensive principles to try and stop as much as possible and prioritise areas of the pitch that you want. So a little task for you. 
Go on. I was just going to say, yeah, just jumping in on that, that the consequence for me, if you are trying to stop everything, is actually you have no idea what the opposition are going to do. So you are back into the area of unpredictability. So trying to stop everything can actually create more problems. So that would just be a point in there I'd make. Perfect. There's your minute. So hopefully you've got your post notes, some ideas on, and obviously you can have a look at that as we go through. Um, I'm going to delve into my thoughts of principles um, and then we're going to have wills. And then, as I say, we'll sort of try and put that together with a few little fun tasks for you. So this is my view of the game. Um, this is how I've sort of shaped my beliefs of the game. I see it as um, structured, unstructured, and then there's a transition period between. So in unstructured play, that's where a lot of the principle work will be. Um, when we're in possession of the ball, that would be our attacking principles of play. And then out of possession of the ball would be our defensive principles. But obviously these apply to that transition bit as well. Um, and in structured play. So I see the, the game in high line attack, outlet with the ball and then pressing in deep defence without the ball. The principles would apply to these different situations. So, of course, within our press, you still apply your defensive principles within that context. But we are being guided by the larger um, structure. And then there's this other little period, just this, I call it a little window, where there's a turnover that happens. So let's just say we're in um, outlet, um, we turn over the ball. We have a point when we are quite structured and then can we regain the ball without losing that structure or do we need to sort of delve into that structure? And I see it as a bit of a dial um, where transition happens in between. Four phases of the game again. So this is... Um, sort of just an overview with ball possession. When you're losing the ball, that's a turnover in defence and then winning the ball back. And then we need to defend in all of these. So within ball possession, we would look to put defence within counter cover. Um, we can delve into that a bit later on, but counter cover will be our sort of defensive strategy whilst we have the ball. When we lose the ball in turnover, what's our initial reaction to that defensively? When we are in deep defence or defending as a team, what are our principles there? And then again, when we try to regain and win the ball. Looking at that regain, these are the sort of three ways to regain the ball. The only other one you could chuck in is an unforced error, but you're not necessarily in control of that. So by interceptions, that's the first way you can win the ball. The first strategy of defence is to win it back through an interception. So can we intercept it without having to then go and make a tackle? Dispossession, uh, obviously making a tackle, winning the ball back. Or can we force an error and try and turn over the ball that way? So just a few examples of how I see this. Um, so it might be that we're pressing the opposition. Uh, they break into a pocket. They play forward. Our press is sort of broken. We then find ourselves in this open play period. That would be an example of going from structure to unstructure. Likewise, with a positive, um, having a long corner, we'd start in the structure. We may gain a circle entry from that and we delve into a bit of unstructured chaos when we get into the circle. And then finally, having a hit out, um, we could turn over the ball from a 16 hit out and then we end up being in counter defence, which is principle driven. And then again, we sort of have this window of react reacting to these turnovers. So what happens? Do we try and regain the ball? Do we jump back? And that sort of leads me to where my principles are. Um, they've sort of changed a little bit and shaped a little bit. Obviously, over time, I think they do. I think they change. Um, and hopefully Mike Hughes approves after me and him had quite a long discussion about it. So prioritising threat is my first point of call. As a player, if I, um, we turn over the ball or there's something to react to, I need to prioritise what my threat is. Uh, and then I make a decision. Am I going to reorganise or am I going to engage with the player? I make that decision by taking in the context. What's the score? Where am I? What's going on? What's my job to do? And then, as I say, I delve into one of these two things. I'm either going to engage with the player enter a contest and that might be a personal battle it might not be by the ball it might be that I've got to just mark my man and do a job there it might be that I've got to run back quicker than my opposite number but that's my job is engaging the player or it might be that I'm out of shape and I need to reorganize where I go and this might be jumping back on the ball side looking to protect the hotline um, creating some structure and communication so hopefully I can show you those examples now so what is threat this is just using this example. If this is the ball, that's the hotline towards goal. Hotline could be the line to goal. There's other names for it as well, but we're using the hotline. Help side and ball side. So the ball side is the side that the ball's on. The help side is the side where the help comes from. And then the ball line is the line of the ball through the pitch. So this varies. If I'm in position A, 
my job would differ to if I'm in position B. If I'm in position A, what I'd be hoping is that I don't identify the threat probably is for me to get on the hotline. I can't engage from the ball from there, so my job is to reorganise. If I'm in position B, my priority would be to get back behind the ball line and hopefully onto the ball side. If I'm in position C, it might be a case that I engage with the ball. And if I'm in position D, I might look into a marking job or I might be the guy that's on the hotline to try and stop that. In terms of engaging the player, um, I'm looking to in, enter the contest. Typically, this is what we think about. I think when we think about individual defending, a lot of the time is this battle between two people. Um, but we're looking to enter the contest, whatever it is. So for me, if you use this example here, there's a few different examples of individual battles here. And I think it's really important that we look to identify differences and the defenders need to, within your principles, be able to identify what their job is. If we all run at the ball, that obviously causes a lot of issues. Um, um, can I just jump in and ask a question? So you've, you've identified, I'm looking particularly at the contest in the middle of the day. How would you judge that? How would you be talking to players around refining that contest? By refining the contest, you mean how are they going to decide which contest they're in? Yeah, and just, how, you know, what, what does the quality look like in there? What, what are you talking to them about? That one in the middle of the circle. Have you got to dominate and own the scoring space, Will? The likely scoring space. Sorry to jump in. That was exactly what I was going to say, obviously. Now, I think it, obviously that's why I think you sort of come back to that prioritised threat and it's sort of a triangle that goes all the way around. And the idea is that, you know, if I'm, if you're talking about the circle... I'll talk about the one nearest the goalkeeper, the two arrows. Like Gibbo says, we've got to, my job there is to stop that player getting the ball. Um, I've always got to have one and a half jobs, I think, is key. So being able to do one job, which is marking the player, and the other job, which is being ready to intercept. But my job there is to be aggressive and low in my defending with that player. And then I've got to trust my teammates to do the other bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Um, another example here. So... Again, there's lots of different battles going on all over the pitch here. What can you see within this image? What other battles can you see? Where can you see other people doing different jobs that might be um, asked of them? So you've got people jumping back behind the ball. You've obviously got someone trying to dispossess. Um, you've got someone trying to get ahead of the ball and then she's tracking her. These are all different individual battles um, as well as then some organisation going on. And then again here, slightly different clip. Ball's going across so it's not such a direct threat. Um, players off the ball if you look at the Australians what are their jobs becoming what are they doing you can see the furthest in the far right um, starting to mark up a player you can see people hovering on the line to goal those sorts of things are what we're looking at and then when we get onto this sort of idea of reorganization um, hopefully this clip sort of uh, explains to you a little bit about that reorganization and puts it all together for you so here Australia in the ball in the circle on the baseline um, and then we see this moment of transition. The ladder's just lashed it across the goal. Um, I'm not sure if Pin has got a touch, but it's now ended up with England coming outside the circle where you can see the ball now. Hotline is there. So we're in that moment of transition in the middle of um, structure and unstructure. Carrying on, um, you can see here we've got players engaging around the ball looking to put pressure on, looking to do their job, which is engaging. We then have other players looking to reorganise. So these guys have obviously all prioritised their threat. This guy's not sure, what am I doing? Am I coming back to protect the line to go or do I need to worry about this man? It's an ever-changing thing and I think this clip's quite good at showing that. As the ball is here again, different roles, he's managed to break a line. We were looking quite set in our structure. These guys are now reorganising where they're going. We've now got into a situation where England are now on the counter-attack and we look quite vulnerable. Um, you can see now that numbers are trying to get back onto the ball side here. This man has to prioritise his threat again. Is my job to engage the player? Is my job to stay with the man that he's tracking? And if you take out the guys who can't really affect the game, we're now in quite an unstructured situation. So with my mantra of sort of control the chaos, we're looking to turn this chaos structure where England have got a 3v4 break to goal um, into a, a defensive win for Australia. So here you can see numbers on the ball side. Got far more numbers of Australians swamping around the ball. You've got a man on, occupying the hotline and still three guys jumping back from the help side. These guys are in their engagement battles. So one guy picking up the man in the middle, one guy looking to go and press the ball. Everyone else is looking to reorganise around. 
So we've got a couple of those ticked. And then now we, you could argue we've got that defensive structure. We've created a bit more structure from the chaos. So we've got three men engaging in different jobs. Everyone else is reorganized and is in a nice sort of defensive structure. So we are now leaning more towards that structured play. And then we managed to force a regain. So these guys managed to force an error. He looks to try and dump pass, I think, and it went wrong. And then Australia win the ball. So in a nutshell, that is really my defensive principles. I've timed it well, so I'm going to see if you're much quicker than that, but I don't think there's too much chance. Any other thoughts or do you want to dive straight in with yours? There is an interesting question from um, Egna about, yep. well, Mark, you can unmute yourself and ask it yourself while I am. So I'm going to have to look at any of the chats. You kind of covered it, to be fair, Elliot. Like, it just in your initial images, there was a lot of one on one duels. So, like, yeah. A lot of defensive structures would be about the generation of a free player. So when you talk with your team, is it is that conversation phrased just around the, the prioritization you mentioned? Or would it would the priority be get a free player or would the priority be get the um, engagement with the ball? So I tend to find myself saying a lot, you know, I'm trying to hint a lot of the players to what's my job. And again, that's trying to get them to get to that prioritize bit um, rather than saying pressure to the ball or you know do do explicit things i'm trying to say things that i think are um trying to guide them towards our principles so i'd say what's your job and hope a lot of the time that does then trigger them onto right my job in this situation i've got to press the man because he's right in front of me or it might be i've got to check my shoulder um if that sort of answers your question so it's trying to get them to make the decision because i think every decision is totally uh different if i just jump back yeah. into here in there, elliot that the goalie has quite a lot of the say in it as well do you actually get closer to the circle a lot yeah. will depend on how comfortable they are to take the shot from a certain area. Um, so I think, yeah. So it's, it's 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 not just about how the coach feels necessarily. It's trying to shape the experience for the others, for the players. I think they have using these images here, I think at this point it's transition. Ball has turned over here. Instantly, we've got a situation where England are carrying straight forward. In this shape here, you're quite comfortable, I imagine, as a team. I think we've got numbers behind the ball. We look quite comfortable. But then ever ever changing as the game is, we try to, he manages to eliminate. And we find ourselves in a situation now where these guys are pretty much out of the game for the time being. And it becomes a threat again. So, as I say, that sort of pendulum keeps swinging. And that's where I want my players to try and reassess what they're doing, try and prioritise what they're doing, what's the job. Um, and then either they're going to reorganise is the first thought if they're away from the ball or they're going to go and engage in a contest if there's someone around them. Cheers. All right. Right, ready? Any other questions or do you want to fly on to yours? I'm fly on because otherwise I'll just... Make me, am I a host yet, by the way? Yeah. Thanks. Way ahead of you. Always. Oh, by the way, Will's probably going to make a joke here about me being Robin. Oh, there it is. Ah... Uh... I was going to say the worrying thing actually is I've just made a pro goalkeeper comment, which is is very odd for me. Uh, I'm going to shut my video off just so my bandwidth doesn't go. Um, so I've I've taken a slightly different tack um, with my presentation, um, but you know it's no surprise Elliot wanted to go first, just in case there's any similarities. We all know the truth. There you go. That's the aforementioned Batman joke. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, right, so I'm just going to start really. We're better to look for coaching inspiration than the Mighty Ducks. So my sort of defensive ideology basically comes down to uh, numbers. And as we know, Ducks fly together. So these are my four defensive pillars. And we're basically trying to turn a team game into an individual's problem. And we can do this through being proactive, having clarity, increasing pressure and playing with a calm intensity. Hopefully that allows us to regain the ball. And it's basically underpinned by the concept of creating numerical uh, supremacy. And it's a, when I say that, I don't mean that we can't obviously win the ball unless we have an overload, but it's the the sort of the drive to create it that supports our ability to win the ball consistently. Firstly, I think it's important that we think ahead and know what we're trying to achieve. So when we get the ball, where do we want it? 
What do we want in terms of support and pressure? What's the best thing that could happen next? How can we support it and are we ready for it? But it's also important to consider what's the worst thing that could happen next. And in, in possession, this leads to the idea of counter protection. The, the balance of this is, is changing throughout games. And my, my personal view is to have more of a, a, a focus on opportunity and not let defensive duties overly restrict how we attack. Um, but also be mindful of threat to ensure that the attack doesn't completely compromise the defence. And I think it's, it's trying to find the balance in the moment to take, yeah, the balance in the moment to take into account the needs of, of the next moment. Next, we're moving on to clarity. So clear thinking results in confident, assertive and purposeful defending. Narrowing the bandwidth of attacking options supports this. Um, additionally, we need a, a framework that applies to both team and individual situations. Mine, there's three elements basically in mine, which is awareness, a clear set of priorities, and good communication. With awareness, I'm talking about understanding ourselves individually, collectively, skills, strengths, weaknesses, anxieties. Um, considering the opposition as well though in the same way and that that leads to this concept of individual duels and the matchup of lines so how our forward line might match up with their defense for example and then it's which one of these we want to optimize and which ones we want to avoid and neutralize uh, so that's basically us developing our game plan which should be a collective awareness of individual and team affordances, cues, triggers, um, leading to the sort of the construction of a shared mental model. Finally, we also need to understand when, when everything's gone to pot and when shit's hit the fan, how we're going to adapt. So I spoke earlier about not all space is equal, so we prioritise it differently when we're defending. My idea is basically that I'm, I'm creating three distinct phases of defending which are linked to the phases of possession. So proactive, uh, proactive is my defending with the ball, uh, which is like my counter protection priorities. Generally transitional defending is defending that occurs in transition between possession and non-possession and structured defending is our out of possession. But they're also how we defend in and out and of set pressing shapes. And if we flip, we flip between them basically in the game as certain areas or layers of presses are broken. So can I, I'm now going to show you what, what I think the commonalities and, and differences are. So between the transition and the structured, priority is pretty much the same. Uh, protect the hotline, trap and seal, increase pressure and numbers. The differences in transitional defending I'm trapping on the ball side, whereas in structural defending, structured defending, we're able to set targeted turnover areas to use. On this slide, hopefully I'll come to life a bit. So to set defensive space, we need two waypoints. And this comes back to the hotline that Elliot spoke about earlier. Um, our primary threat includes the hotline and the space towards the D. You can also see where I draw the spine. This is where I get a bit controversial. And that separates the ball side and the support side. Uh, did you call it the help side, Al? Yeah, yeah so I did. That's where the help comes from for me. Yeah. Um, I think most people would draw the, the spine fixed P-spot to P-spot. But my feeling is it's important that it's dynamic um, because it's like a defensive pressure release valve so if we don't seal the spine the ball can travel into the secondary threat and the hotline is now less congested and we can't hunt as a pack if we're spineless the tertiary threat is a good win um, it's where we want the ball to go if we're transitional defending and um, so that's our target area sealing the spine forces the ball into that part of the pitch 
And then finally, sending the ball away from our goal is also a massive win for us because we can get numbers back, protecting the hotline and the primary threat. We can organise set shapes and we can start to press on the front foot. Finally, looking at pressure and... And this is where my analogy of hunting as a pack comes in. I'm a big fan of, of analogy and storytelling in terms of trying to articulate both technical uh, elements, but also certainly tactical elements. Um, I hope you've got a paracetamol because um, this one's going to give you a migraine, I think. So these are the different types of pressure. So we've got, in my mind, we've got cognitive, spatial, visual, time, and technical. And I'll, I'll go through them now, but trying to bring them to life, really, with this analogy. So you can see that by dictating options and giving a dilemma where neither choice is a preference and showing the target, the picture we want them to see, we can apply this cognitive pressure and cognitive stress which can create indecision then if we reduce the field of vision and draw the focus where we want it we can start to isolate by adding visual pressure and and that's really key because the player is now no longer or in this case the buffalo bison whatever it is is now no longer available of its support or its teammates around it, it's been distracted in terms of the focus. Then we can deny space, set a trap and seal it. And you can see that starting to happen in the bottom. And if we harry and rush our opponent, we can reduce thinking time, again, increasing cognitive stress, but also increasing pressure on decision-making. It's important to acknowledge now as well, if we didn't have the numbers, this is a, a different type of time pressure we'd need to use would be delay to allow us to get the numbers in there to defend and increase the pressure. But finally, we want to engage in the contest on our terms to dictate the duel. We pick the battleground and we choose the rules of engagement. Once we've applied pressure, we need to maintain it. This is one of my big buzz phrases. Um, and increase it until we achieve the outcome. And all of this is, it comes back down to this idea of defending's not binary, in my opinion. It's, the game is very spectral. We have to operate in the gray and we can't take our foot off the gas and allow it to become binary. Likewise, we can't jump in and allow ourselves to be eliminated. It's, it's gotta be operating in the gray. So running through this quickly, we identify and dictate our opposite number by applying cognitive pressure. We then isolate and trap them with visual and spatial pressure. We then turn the screw, adding time and technical pressure, really ramping all the pressure up. Then by staying in the contest, maintaining an increase and increasing pressure, we can then get this numerical supremacy and hopefully turn the ball over. And then that leads us back to my four pillars, and they're a bit more fleshed out now. The other thing, I just, just to finish on really, is looking back at the technical pressure, and I said how we decide how to engage. I think each duel is really unique to the participants within it. And I touched on with clarity and awareness, that idea of understanding yourself, understanding the opposition. Ultimately, to dictate and dominate duels, we have to know what the high percentage options are. For me, there's some key anchors in there. And one is certainly, in my opinion, staying forehand or trying to win the ball forehand. It could be, as Elliot said, showing on your backhand with the intent to win it on your forehand. But also staying mobile, and that's that operating the grey uh, gray concept again. Both of these have to be emphasized consistently with players. Oops, gone wrong. Get that out of the way. It's all going. Oh, you had too many things on your slide. I know, yeah. Um, and that that hopefully in a nutshell is is turning a team game into an individual's problem.
we'll come back to that in a second. Yeah, go. Okay, so um, for me, I think it's really important that we don't just talk about tactical, technical, physiological, but we're also thinking about the psychological aspects of defending. Um, this is the final pillar of mine, which is this um, idea of how we execute. Um, so it's with a calm, with a calm intensity, and talking about emotional regulation, even when we've got a physical high intensity and uh, measured technical execution and composed decision making all, all the way through that. So when we're really ramping up um, our intensity, are we able to have much more detail and composure in terms of how we play? One thing around this I think is really important is understanding how your interactions will um, affect the emotional state and the arousal level of your players. And, and we've all been there in terms of, you know, hearing coaches or being the coach, so press, 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 pressure on the ball, blah, blah, blah. And you're really ramping up um, the stimulus for that player and then they go in a million miles an hour and scythe down the attacker and you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Where does that come from? Blah, blah, blah. So it's just understanding and appreciating how your interactions will have an emotional impact on the player. And within that, you know, fools rush in, as it were. So what I've got here is a, a girl going in full tilt, um, high physical intensity, but in terms of her composure and her, you know, her ability to stay mobile, very limited. Um, whereas we look at Ashley Jackson in this picture, high physical intensity. You can tell by his face, you know, he's, he's really pushing the envelope but it is measured technical execution and calm decision-making. And for me, I'd be looking at that and thinking about that emotional regulation that he's got going on there. Um, the other thing around this is the idea of staying in the contest, which touched on earlier, and being able to operate in the grey. For me, the game is not binary. If we play in a binary way, we're either going to win the ball or get absolutely rinsed. So it's trying to put ourselves in the position where we can be mobile, we can be calm and we can be, at the same time, aggressive and assertive. Uh, same down here, high physical intensity, measured technical execution. And the, the final thing I'll just put up is trying to take a bit of influence from the New Zealand All Blacks. And Daniel Coyle's written quite a lot about this. So uh, I think it, for those of you that haven't encountered it, might want to explore it after this. And it's the idea of blue head thinking which is how the All Blacks develop their emotional skills and also learn how to moderate their um, competitive temperament, as it were. So that would be where I'd be coming from, looking at it. And then if I just dive over to a, um, another image. Um, so I stole this image from uh, Olivier Coulon, who's a friend of mine. I just thought it was cool to stick in um, and it's just about getting the technicals right. So, you know, are we approaching the right situation with the right technical response? And again, you know, we come back to probably it depends, but having to think about, are you in mid, high or low body position? Are we looking to dispossess channel delay? What's the situation and what's the context? It keeps coming back to the context is king. Um, and certainly in the WhatsApp groups, I'm in context and it depends the two most used phrases. Um, but what we want to try and do now is encourage you guys to look at some practice design. Do we want to just dive straight into that now, Will? And do you want me to share? I'll share this. Just so share the mentee see. then. Yeah. So this is where we're at at the moment. Can people see that? So that's so it's very broad, but there are some pretty good themes in there. I would say certainly calm, mobile, aggressive, consistent, purposeful. There's some good stuff in there. Um, keep adding to that if you want and what we'll do is at the end I'll download it and forward it out in an email as an image 